Welcome to this crash course in Boolean polynomials, binary decision diagrams, and compressed right hand side equations. My name is JP Indroy, and I will be your host for this journey. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's buckle up and get started. Our first stop is binary decision diagrams, compressed right hand side equations, and Boolean polynomials. And we'll have a look on how these are all related. Thereafter, we will see how we can use compressed right hand side equations to model SBN based primitives then how we can attack using attack these SBN primitives using compressed right hand side equations before we'll introduce you to our research tool CryptoPath. Binary decision diagram is a rooted directed acyclical graph with labeled nodes. The two sync nodes called the terminal nodes are labeled with the boolean constants 0 and 1. The remainder of the nodes are called decision nodes and they are labeled with boolean variables as in a single variable for each node. Every node can have at most two outgoing edges, and these edges is either the zero edge or the one edge. As the name indicates, the one edge has the value one and is represented by the solid lines. The zero edge has the value zero is rep represented by the dashed lines. Choosing the solid line, the one edge out of a node, is the same as assigning the value 1 to the associated labeled variable. Same goes for choosing the dashed line, choosing that is assigning a zero value to the associated variable. Binary decision diagrams are closely related to Boolean functions. They actually can actually represent Boolean functions. We'll see this demonstrated by a truth table first. Our BDD has eight paths in it. We therefore have eight, pa eight paths in, sorry, eight entries in the truth table. One entry corresponds to one path. And walking through the binary decision diagram will fill the truth table. Of course, you can go the other way as well, going from a truth table and create a binary decision diagram based on that. Another useful feature is they can actually build the algebraic normal form directly from a binary decision diagram. This is done by apply applying the Shannon expansions from the bottom and all the way up. This will assign algebraic normal forms to each of the uh, nodes in the graph. And then eventually you will have a algebraic normal form associated with the root node and this uh, algebraic normal form, this ANF, is what we consider the associated with the whole binary decision diagram and that the binary decision diagram represents this Boolean function. Now I will not go into detail how we do it, but essentially if you want to pause the video right here and go uh, see for yourself, you feel free to welcome, feel free to do so. And again, of course, we can go the opposite way. We can start with an algebraic normal form and a root node. We can, for instance, choose to go through the zero edge, which means we replace the um, associated variable, in this case, x0, with the constant zero. If you go through the one edge, you replace it with one. These will be the associated algebraic normal forms for the children. And then we repeat the repeat the process for all the, um, for as long as there are al algebraic normal forms associated with a decision node until we only have the sinks or the terminal nodes left. Next, we want to see how we can go from binary decision diagrams to compressed right hand side equations. There are essentially three changes we make to binary decision diagrams to make them or transform them or whatever you want to call it into compressed right hand side equations. Firstly, we extract all the associated uh, linear variables, Boolean variables, to the left hand side and we associate them instead of with the nodes, they are now associated with the levels. Secondly, we remove the zero terminal node and all associated edges to it. This makes it from representing a Boolean function into representing a Boolean equation. Lastly, we allow 
linear combinations to be associated with the levels instead of only uh, a single boolean variable. An important feature of allowing, yeah, we see a binarization on the left hand side and compressed right hand side equation on the right hand side right now. Uh, an important aspect of allowing linear combinations is the fact that we now have solution sets of a compressed right hand side equation. The solution set of a compressed right hand side equation is a union of the solution sets of all linear equation systems given by the left hand side and the path through the dog. Uh, we call the path through the dog for the right-hand side, right-hand sides of the compressed right-hand side equation. So, for instance, if we choose the path 101 and associate this with the left-hand side, we get the linear equation system as seen on screen right now. We can solve the system and get this solution. We can do the same for the two remaining paths in the right hand side of the graph of the compressed right hand side equation and we get a total of three solutions one for each of the linear equation systems then we can put these into the union and this is a solution set for the whole system sorry the whole compressed right hand side equation another interesting feature is that we can still use channel expansions to find the algebraic normal form of the boolean equation that this compressed right hand side equation represents this is done the same way as we do it for binary decision diagrams and we actually get again an anf associated with the root node and this is the algebraic normal form that we see that the compressed right hand side equation represents this is very um, is not very relevant when we go to the modeling and attacking part later, but it's relevant for the operations I will talk about now, because doing, uh, being able to calculate this algebraic normal form means that we can show that these operations are um, well defined. And I will again have to ask you to go to the literature to find the details about how these operations work. The first operations I want to I wanna introduce briefly is a swap operation. This one swaps the order of two adjacent levels in a binary decision diagram, a compressed right-hand side equation. For the left-hand side, it's very easy. You just swap the two linear combinations. But the right-hand side will have to be adjusted accordingly. My main point here is, again, even though the bottom level has different um, algebraic normal forms of Boolean equations associated with them, the root node ends up having the same algebraic normal form. So we haven't changed the Boolean equation that the compressed right-hand side equation represents. Second, we have the add operation. This one adds one level onto a level directly below it. Again, we will update the paths, the, the directed icyclical graph as we need. And I want to again want to make out the point that the root node is the the Boolean equation associated with the compressed right-hand side is not changed. Third operation is what we call level extraction. This one can be performed only if we have a constant in a left-hand side or associated with a constant that is the linear combination associated with a level. When this is the case, we have to remove the outgoing edges that is of the opposite value to the constant. In this case, our constant value is zero, and since zero cannot be equal to one, which it would have been if we tried to follow a one edge out of that level, we have to remove this one edge. And in this case, it means we also remove the following node. Next, we can show uh, that it is valid to actually just extract this whole reminder of the level. And we do so by having the all the in edges to a node point directly to the child of that node instead. Essentially, this means we actually extract a whole level from a binary decision diagram and we have one level less. Again, the root node ANF does not change. All these three operations may leave a um, compressed right-hand side or binary decision diagram in a unreduced form. An unreduced form is when you have one or no, sorry, two or more 
nodes on a level that has the same linear combination. In our example, the bottom, the bottom level has three nodes with L2 plus 1. We can reduce this simply by merging these three nodes into one. This does not alter the Boolean function or Boolean equation associated with the binary decision diagram or compressed right hand side equation. We've now very briefly introduced binary decision diagrams, compressed right hand side equations, and seen how they relate to Boolean functions and Boolean equations. And we've also seen some essential operations that are necessary for uh, not the modeling part, but the attacking part later. Next on our, on our agenda is to see how we can use compressed right hand side equations to model SBN based ciphers. An SBN based cipher or an SBN cipher consists of repeated applications of linear and nonlinear transformations. The first step we perform when we want to model such a cipher in or such a primitive in terms of compressor right hand side equations is to assign variables to certain spots or states of the primitive. The easiest part to start is by assigning the the plain text variables and ciphertext variables. These will be variables when we model the primitive, but when we attack it later on, we will replace it with constants. Secondly, for all the output bits of the nonlinear layer, all the output bits of the S-boxes, we will associate with fresh variables. This is because we don't know what the values are supposed to be at this point in time. The same goes for the key variables. They are unknown to us and we have to represent them by variables. The input bits to S-boxes will be linear combinations of these unknown variables. This also goes for the output bits of the last round, round's nonlinear layer, as these can be represented as linear combinations in the ciphertext uh, variables and key variables of the last round. Okay, so these are assigning all the variables. Our next step now is to go from here and make compressed right hand side equations. And one compressed right, compressed right hand side equation is modeled based on one S box of the primitive. So if we zoom in on this one, we see one S box and we have the input and the output bits. Now, as I mentioned, the input bits to an S box will be the linear combinations um, in the unknown variables of that previous round. And the output bits will be the, the unknown fresh set of unknown variables for the next round. Now, this deals with the input and the output of the, of the S box, but we now have to deal with the S box itself. And the input and the output variables will actually become the left-hand side of the compressed right-hand side equation. And the S-box will become the, the graph part, the right-hand side of the compressed right-hand side equation. We will use the S-box of low MC as an example here, as it's a very nice three-bit S-box. Our first step in, in modeling or creating the graph is to model the, uh, to make the two first levels, top levels based on the two input linear combinations, the two first input bits to the S-box. Our next step is to create the three bottom layers based on the three output bits of the S-box. And then we all connect these through the last remaining input bit. Essentially what we're doing here is we're saying that we know what if we have if we know the input value to an S box, we also know that what the associated output value should be. So we make this into one path. So that means that for this S box for the low MC we have eight eight possible input output pairings and we therefore have eight paths through the graph. For instance, if we take the input 
value 0, 0, 1, we know that we should have the output value 1, 1, 0. And indeed, we do find this in the uh, we do find this path in the graph. To do a quick recap here, we associate the input bits of the S box with the top layers of the graph, the output bits with the bottom layer of the graph, and then we construct the graph itself as specified by how the input and output pairings of the Xbox, Xbox are specified. This is how we create one compressed right and side equation. But we want to model the whole primitive and to do that we need one compressed right and side equation for each application of an S-box in the primitive. So we have as many compressed right and side equations as we have applications of S-boxes. Um, such a system of compressed right and side equations is, we just call it SOC, a SOC for short, and a system of compressed right and Compressed right hand side equation is a set of compressed right hand side of all the compressed right hand side equations which model one instance of a primitive. So that is how we can use compressed right hand side equations to model um, an SBN based primitive. Now we're also interested to see if we can use this to uh, find the secret key values or pre images of, of primitives. And we can do this by solving a system of compressed right hand side equations. Solving a system of compressed right hand side equations is essentially trying to find a solution set of the system of compressed right hand side equations. So what is the solution set? Well, the solution set of, uh, of a compressed right hand side equation is the intersection of the solution sets of each compressed right hand side equation that is part of the system itself. So for instance, in this toy example here, we have two compressed right hand side equations in the system. The first one has a solution set in the blue square. The other one has its solution set in the green figure. And in this case, the solution set to the system of compressed right hand side equations is found again in the intersection of both these two individual solution sets. And for us, it is the point zero one one. Now, this was very easy to find for only two, for a system that only contains two compressed right hand side equations. If we have multiple, and we will have multiple when you model primitives, finding this um, intersection is, is more difficult. Um, the way we actually do find this, this intersection is to identify linear combinations, sorry, linear dependencies in the system as a whole, and then resolve these ones. So let's take a close look what I mean by that. This is another toy example that I, a toy system I made to for our example. It consists of three systems, no, sorry, three compressed right hand side equations, C0, C1, and C2. And if you look at each one of them individually, they have no linear dependencies among themselves. But if you look at them as a system, you will see that we find one, two, three linear dependencies. Now this is easy to see for us visually when you only have three. If you have more, it's more complicated. And the way we actually find it when you have multiple or system that a system that has multiple compressed right hand side equations is you take all the left hand sides, just stack them on top of each other, make a matrix out of it, you gauss it as normal and then you will find the linear dependencies in the resulting augmented matrix. So for instance, we find a blue linear dependency on the second to last row, the red linear dependency on the third last row, and the green linear dependency on the bottom row. Since we also know how we initially stacked these linear dependencies together, we know that the three last columns of this final matrix belongs to the C2 comp compressed right hand side equation. The next three columns to the C1 and then the next three columns to the C0. This is useful because this tells us which um, 
compressed right hand side equations, we need to combine or join, as we say, in order to actually be able to start to resolve linear dependencies. So let's say we want to resolve this linear, this blue linear dependency. That means that we need to join C0 and C2 together. Joining is a very simple operation. All we need to do is to replace the sink node or the terminal node of the first compressed right hand side equation with the source node of the second. So combining C2 and C0 or C0 on top and C2 on the bottom here, we get this new compressed right hand side equation. Now joining in this way will give us more path than we initially had. It will actually give us the multiple of the number of first paths in the first compressed right hand side equation with the second one. When, uh, when we do this, we may actually have paths that are what we call inconsistent, meaning that if you choose this, this path, then you will actually have uh, an inconsistent or no solution to the system. We need to get rid of these inconsistent paths. paths. Um, the reason we have these inconsistent paths are because we have a linear dependency. So the way we can get rid of these paths is to resolve the linear dependency. Resolving a linear dependency is what we call a linear absorption. And linear absorption consists of repeatedly swapping and adding levels until we can perform a level extraction. So in this case, we could, for instance, start by adding the top level to the second top level, then we swap the next two, we swap again so we get x1 adjacent to x1, we then add x1 to x1, and of course we've updated the right hand side according to the rules of add and swap all the way, and now we can actually see that we have a uh, the constant zero at at the, as, as a result of the add operation, and we can now extract this level. And we end up with a uh, com compressed right hand side equation that has no linear dependencies, and all the paths that are left in this right hand side are all consistent paths. They are paths that will yield a consistent system when assigned to the left hand sides. Um, now, I just want to point out that the swap and add operations in our case have actually added more nodes to the system and this is not uncommon and I will come back to this point a bit later. Okay, so now we solved the first independency by joining C0 and C2 together into one. But we still know that the system as a whole had originally three linear dependencies, meaning we have two left, the red one and the green one. To get rid of these ones, we need to we would need to join C1 with C02, and then perform linear absorption on both of these linear dependencies to get rid of them. Doing so, we end up with this compressed right hand side equation. This compressed right hand side equation has no linear dependencies, so it has only consistent paths in here, meaning that if you were to choose any one path through this right hand side, assign it to the system of linear equations that the left hand side is, and then solve for this system, you can actually easily find uh, all the, the values of all the value variables you're interested in. Key variables, pre-image variables, you find them in there. I did mention that we grow in nodes when we swap and add. This is actually the difficult part of our attack, that we run out of memory very easily. Uh, we actually observe that we have what we call a, um, a growth followed by a tipping point. If we can reach this tipping point, we will actually find all solutions to the system. If we are unable to reach this, this tipping point, our attack fails and we do not find the solutions. It's still an ongoing question or an open question um, to try and predict when this tipping point will occur. We also have observed, or it's also important to point out, that this behavior also depends on the order of the resolving of the linear dependencies. So how, which one you choose when and how you choose to join compressed right hand side equations are important in, in terms of memory consumption. 
Okay, this leaves us to or leads us to CryptoPath, which is our research tool for looking into systems of compressed right hand side equations. CryptoPath is actually two libraries where CryptoPath itself is an early stage research tool that we use to, um, well, research compressed right hand side equations. We've spent quite a bit of time trying to make it as memory efficient as possible in terms of, of yeah, I mean, in terms of memory. <laughs> it contains all the basic operations for compressed right hand side equations, including a novel drop operation, as mentioned in our paper. And essentially, CryptoPath is the model, if you, what we use to model primitives. The other library we call Crush. This is the library that is responsible for turning primitives into system of compressed right hand side equations and is also um, the library that is responsible for the solving algorithm and the, the attack part itself. We can turn any primitive that adheres to, adheres to our contract or in rest a trait can be any primitive ad adhering to it can be turned into a system of compressed right hand side equations. We currently support uh, known plain text ciphertext attack and also pre image um, on sp sponge hashes. And we have the ability to fix bits, any bits at your choosing, and we also can vary the number of rounds. Um, we also support custom solving algorithms which is, as I mentioned, important because how you choose to try and solve the system of compressed, of compressed right hand sides will affect the memory consumption and the complexity of the overall attack. Now, our long-term goal is not only to use this as a research tool, we also wish to be able to use it or for it to become a useful tool when designing primitives. I do admit we're not there yet, uh, we're hoping to get there, but we're still well, working on it. So why do we public go public now with these libraries? And the, um, and the short story is we wish to standardize a way of, of making these contracts of the primitives or reference implementations. And what I mean by that is we were inspired by a, a tool written in Rust called Cryptograph where they also wanted to be able to like give us a reference implementation that adheres to our contract and we will transform it into what we need to be able to well analyze it in terms of differential trails. Unfortunately we were not able to use their contract for our purposes and we would like to try and get the community at large or anyone interested into making a, a standardized way of, of, of coding these reference implementations such that we only need to make one reference implementation and we can use it for cryptograph, for cryptopath or for any other tool that will eventually become available out there. Well, as we mentioned, um, cryptopath is still somewhat early in, in the workings, but we have belief in it and we believe that compressed right hand side equations has potential. For instance, in the terms of modeling and other attacks, or we are hoping to be able to model ARX ciphers. We're wondering if we, if we, by changing how we model the primitives, if we can then use it for linear hull or differential attacks. And we also know that there are primitives out there that is not binary per se, and we hope that we can generalize our model to to work on any p airy primitive yeah yeah you, you like to try on the key recovery in pre-image attacks well improving a solving algorithm would be a very <laughs> good first step because it has not had it's not nearly as efficient as we we wish it to become um if we can try and find any ways to predict where the tipping point will be, that would also be a, a very good boost in terms of trying to estimate a security margin, margin of primitives we're not able to break today. And also maybe using multiple known plain text and ciphertext pairs when you model 
an attack a cipher uh, a primitive can be there at least there is some literature out there that suggests that this can be a very good way to lower the overall complexity okay this was very fast and very a lot of things but i want to say thank you for your attention and please don't hesitate to uh, if you have any questions to ask me see you at the q a